If you're still completely certain that the market is going to crash next month, put your money where your mouth is. Welcome back everybody, my name's Paul. If you've never seen me before, I recently started investing. My investment portfolio has taken a serious beating right after I started. And now it's slowly starting to recover. As a new investor, I've had to make a few changes in how I deal with the news. Before I started investing, most of the news was just nothing to me. And I'd be really into reading what everyone thought on Facebook about politics, about Donald Trump, about Boris Johnson. Now I really couldn't give a f f shit uh, hoot. Sorry, I'm trying to swear less. YouTube doesn't like me swearing. Now I couldn't give a damn what's going on in the news, as long as it doesn't affect my investments. But yeah, I don't care about politics anymore. You can privatize the NHS all you want as long as my healthcare REIT's getting paid. So my new life right now is about reading the news in a totally different way and mostly try to ignore the majority of it. That's because part of my investment strategy is not to buy the news and just buy and hold for a long time. It doesn't mean you should ignore it completely, but as long as I'm not acting solely on the latest newspaper headline, I'm doing okay. Like this week, the CEO of AstraZeneca went on CNN and decided to talk about how they're almost definitely going to have a vaccine ready in September. At almost exactly the same time, Oxford University, who's working on the vaccine with AstraZeneca, they decided to tell the whole world that there's less chance of having a vaccine ready because they're actually running out of people with coronavirus to actually test on. The point is here that while there is a lot of money to be made by following the news, day trading, that sort of thing, I don't think I'm smart enough to do that, and I don't think I've got the patience to do that either. But there is some serious money being made. Like this week when Carlsberg and Marston's announced that they were joining together. I have had a good few warnings about this, and it looks like quite a few of you have made some serious cash off this deal. The Marston's Carlsberg merger is quite a bullish deal in this market. It's a big move by Carlsberg, and it's likely to pay off. Overall, this deal is likely to be very good for both companies but it definitely favors one more than the other. The deal feels very one-sided in my opinion. At first look, it looks like Carlsberg and Marston's have joined together to make the future of the pub industry much brighter. But in reality, it looks like Carlsberg have just bought the best parts of Marston for about 300 million. The deal has allowed Carlsberg to take over all of the breweries, make a lot of efficiency savings, which may put people's jobs at risk, and it's also meant that Carlsberg have now got their products front and center at a lot of pubs in the UK. Carlsberg has also managed to avoid all of the risk in the deal. The Marston press releases made it sound like they put their foot down and made sure Carlsberg had no access to their pub trade. And Carlsberg went, oh no, don't let us have access to all those failing pubs. That's because Marston's pub business is about 1.3 billion in debt. And the only real strategy that they've got to finance it is by selling some of the pubs. Marston's boasts about 1,600, 1,700 pubs, but if you search on the website, it looks like only about 1,400 of them are actually open. I'm just assuming there that some of their 1,600 pubs are probably sitting there derelict and unused, and then some of those 1,400 pubs aren't really profitable at all. And with the historical decline of the pub industry, it doesn't look like there's going to be a bidding war to come out and revamp some old pubs. Many of those pubs are going to be grade listed and a nightmare for developers. That's why a lot of old derelict pubs sit around for years and years until they spontaneously catch fire and then get sold onto housing developments. So the deal doesn't feel as great to me as what Marston's would have you think. Ultimately, Carlsberg has set itself up in a position to take over a company that has got itself into a little bit too much debt. And this is the third big deal of this type in just a year. It kind of suggests to me that the pub industry is still on a slight decline and it's going to take some real innovation to get everything back up. And notice that I've gone through all of this without mentioning the virus, which just adds further uncertainty to an industry that's already struggling. Carlsberg Marston's, as it's now going to be known, is going to be a major player in this industry, where it's probably only going to be run by one or two companies. So yes, Carlsberg Marston is likely to be at the top of that now. Still, not gonna be an investment for me, way too uncertain, in my opinion. 
but I now have a proven track record where when I try to tear apart a company, the next day it'll just go up in price. And that's the Port Briscoe guarantee. But in general, it's been a very nice week for the markets. Uh, my portfolio is up 4.77, which is nice. It was higher than that until today. I think we're having a nice sell off at the end of this week. Big winner for me this week is the INRG ETF, uh, going really, really well. Paid its dividend out today as well, which was lovely. This was highly powered by Nordex, which is one of my riskier stocks. They are a wind turbine manufacturer in Germany, and they're getting a lot of orders at the moment. Uh, it's a riskier stock, so I don't have a lot of money in it, but it's doing quite well. Rio Tinto, I'm still very happy with. Only good news really is coming out uh, other than the regular controversial news with buying a totally unethical stock. As I mentioned last week, the REITs are doing really well and Tritax Big Box is definitely benefiting from that. And Walt Disney has had a sell-off this week, probably a good time to get buying for me. And this sell-off has been solely caused by some of the major banks reviewing Walt Disney and saying that its target price is too high. I think they've set a target price of 102 now. And for some reason, just because they said it, everyone started selling. Even though the parks are opening back up, there's new movies coming out and Disney Plus has done exceptionally well during the market downturn. I think one bank even suggested that Walt Disney was not a good stock to buy and hold at present. I don't agree with that at all, but then what do I know? The truth is that even though this week we've seen a massive market rise, there's still the possibility of another big crash. Berkshire Hathaway still hasn't moved. It's still sitting on all that cash. And a lot of people are starting to get a lot more aggressive, calling him outdated, saying that value investing is dead, and just generally tearing Warren Buffett apart. It's amazing how quickly the tides can turn on someone. Bill Ackman, who's another big investor, pulled all of his shares out of Berkshire Hathaway this week, dealing another blow. He basically thinks he can do the job better than Berkshire now, just piling on more negativity to the value investing strategy and saying that Warren Buffett has completely missed the boat. There's a couple of theories why Berkshire Hathaway hasn't moved at all yet. First, we have to take into account that while Berkshire Hathaway is primarily an investment company, it's also one of the world's biggest insurance companies. And we're about to approach a period of time where we really don't know what's gonna to happen to the insurance industry. So someone has come up with the theory that Berkshire Hathaway is saving the cash up just in case the COVID-19 insurance claims turn out to be a lot more expensive than we expect. It's mainly thought though that Berkshire Hathaway is just still waiting. They're holding back a significant portion of the world's wealth just in case the second crash comes and they can get in when companies really do need the help. If that does happen, a lot of people will be eating their words. He's kind of sticking to the fearful greedy thing. While all of us are sitting on our phones clicking buy, 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 he's just sitting there with his cash because he can afford to. But the US Federal Reserve has been very clear that it doesn't think there's going to be another big crash or another depression. And even the UK government and Bank of England are even predicting that it's not as bad as they first thought. Everyone now appears to be thinking that there's going to be a big recession over the next year or two, which to me isn't that bad. No one now believes in the big V-shaped recovery, but as the fear of that big second crash starts to fade out a little bit, the big crash believers are cranking up the rhetoric and getting a lot more aggressive. The US Reserve is apparently still pumping in loads of money, buying up companies' debt as bonds. That will artificially inflate stock markets all over the world and create a massive bubble. While these figures of 21 trillion, 24 trillion have been batted around, it's not actually that clear how much the Federal Reserve has actually put in so far. Many are saying that the actual stock market price push is less driven by the actual money the Fed are putting in, but more by the money that you or I are putting in because we think that the Federal Reserve is going to save everything. It's even possible that the Federal Reserve didn't actually even have to spend any money. They could have just told us they were going to and we would have all blindly put our money back in anyway. But they have definitely put money in, just in case anyone thinks, I don't think they have done that. The belief in the second crash comes from the idea that the money has to eventually stop being printed. And when the Federal Reserve announced that they aren't gonna be involved anymore, that's when things are gonna come crashing down. But then Jerome Powell has already said that there's unlimited money, they're not gonna stop until at least September, and the market is going to stay propped up. And the best guess that we've got as to why they're doing this is mainly centered around the US general election that's coming up this year. This market crash has come at a terrible time for the Republicans. Their voters are generally a lot older, they're relying on their pensions, they're relying on their dividends to survive, and in this climate, it is not going well. 
If these pensions don't recover in time for the election, then there's a few models out there that suggest that Republicans aren't going to do very well at all. But really, do you think Donald Trump is going to lose to Joe Biden? My answer to everyone who's waiting for that next crash is, why would you bet against the most powerful entity on the planet? The US government is an institution with unlimited resources and unlimited money. And its only goal right now is to keep the stock market afloat. When the UK GDP figures came out a couple of weeks ago, we saw about a 5% sell-off. And this week it's like we've completely forgotten about it. And US unemployment and consumer confidence are ridiculously down, but that didn't make a single dent. And why is the market doing this? Well, it's possible that it's already priced in. It's possible that all of us investors believe that we know the economy is bad, but we know it will get better, and therefore we're happy to put our money back in. It's very possible that people aren't spending and lending right now, not because they don't want to, but because they just can't. Everything's closed. And as soon as everything opens back up, we'll be applying for credit cards and we'll be spending money on loads of holidays because we haven't been able to go on them. There's a trickle of evidence out there for this because now that the housing market is back open, there's been a record amount of applications for new mortgages, suggesting that we just weren't buying houses because we couldn't, but we still wanted to. Also, a long-winded recession doesn't necessarily mean there's going to be more downturn. It only means that from this point, it's not going to be better than it was, say, three months ago. There's a lot of optimism right now that the world stock markets could just continue to grow very, very slowly right through quarter two, right through all the bad news and continue to grow onto new highs. And really, there doesn't seem to be that much emotional evidence for another big sell off right now. When people finally realize how messed up the economy is right now, the crash believers believe that's when the market will sell off and they're going to be crisp and cool and be buying in when everybody else is selling. Excellent in theory if you can figure out when it is. To me, it doesn't feel like the world is in ridiculous trouble, but then I haven't been seriously affected. I've still got good job security, but thank you so much for people getting involved in my poll the other day. I was trying to do a very unscientific bit of research to see if people who would generally watch a YouTube investment channel still had access to money, have a job, have a lot of money to invest in the market still. And to be fair, the results were fairly mixed fairly uncertain, like all the jobless figures are right now. Thank you very much to everyone who was getting involved there. It has helped to figure out what the emotional situation of the market might be right now. But it is worth noting that most of us have got a bit of a taste for investing right now. It's not going to notice that this channel has now reached 5,000 subscribers and it's done it quite quickly. And that isn't because these videos that I'm making are anything particularly exceptional but it probably correlates directly with how many people are signing up to Trading212 right now. That means there's a significant increase in appetite for investing during this downturn. And that could be adding millions, if not billions, to the stock market. In my opinion, the continuation of this bull run relies on these new investors. It relies on them having a job so they can continue investing for long term. It relies on us new investors to be able to still invest spare money that we have, meaning that investors like you and I still need to be able to afford to put some extra money in and that new investors need to not be looking for the quick buck, not be looking to sell out as soon as the market recovers, but they need to be in it for the long term and expect that the markets won't always be this rosy. And this dumb money that comes from me and it comes from you and it comes from all of us new investors needs to keep going for long enough so the smart money starts to get itchy and has no choice but to get back in the market and create more stability. There's actually a really good possibility of this. People are less scared of the stock market now. Younger people are less scared of the stock market with commission free apps and people are starting to understand the benefit of long term investing. It feels like there's been a little bit of an awakening with people having a lot more access to resources and information like on YouTube, like on websites, and the dumb money is getting a little less dumb. It's taking a while. Oh, Jesus, it's a long one. I've been trying to look back at the 2008 crisis and try and find out if there was something similar going on back then, where the economy is doing one thing, but the markets are doing completely the opposite. And it turns out it happens all the time. Between 2008 and 2019, there were pundits all the time just guessing at where the market was going and not really knowing at all. Take a look at this video. The smart money is angry. Yes, the smart money is furious. Oh, they're so, oh, they're mean, they're mad, they're angry. Why? 
they're jealous of the dumb money that's buying stocks and those stocks are going higher all sorts of stocks and it's just infuriating to the people who do this stuff for a living the pros they hate what's happening right now in this market because it's not supposed to happen second example what's calling charlie right now netflix weather's bad don't go see catching fire it's too cold too wet too whatever stay home watch netflix so let's buy netflix oh boy is that ever a hated view but it's a reality netflix is love go ask your kids now this is a guy who i recently discovered called jim kramer He's been around for a long time. Lots of people in the investment world will know him. His TV show on CNBC is like a fireworks display. He makes loads of crazy noises. Uh, I barely learn anything, but he does have some interesting points sometimes. And that video is from 2013, one of the biggest stock market rises in history. That year, the stock market rose about 30%. Unemployment was ridiculously high and consumer confidence was ridiculously low. And while our current situation appears to be much, much worse, the markets were still not doing what the economy says it should do. Dumb money was propping up the market and the smart money was sitting around scratching its head, wondering why life doesn't make much sense. The way I see it is that the smart money often just looks at the numbers all the time, but the dumb money is generally in control of all the emotional parts of the market, which is what causes the moves. I'm sure I'll get a lot of comments about how there is smart money moving and blah, blah, blah. But the truth is the market hasn't fully recovered yet, so the smart money can't be involved yet. In fact, the big hedge funds have been very vocal about how they're still short in the market. And if you are one of these people that believes the market is still going to crash, you can short the market too. Traditionally, short in the market has been left to the big hedge funds. You have to have a lot of money to get involved and bet with the big banks. When you buy a stock with the idea that it's going to grow, you are said to be going long on a stock. More stupid jargon in the investment world. However, you can't buy a stock with the idea that the asset will depreciate. So what some privileged people can do is they can go to a bank and make a bet with the bank that a stock or a market will get worse. If you're in the CFD and the day trading world, then you can do this on a daily basis, but it costs a lot of money to do this long term. But in Trading212 Invest and in the ISA, you can actually buy into a short ETF like this X-Trackers S&P 500 inverse double leverage, which means you can buy stock in this ETF. And if the S&P 500 crashes again, this ETF will act inversely and at double the amount. So if you bet correctly and this ETF goes in the opposite direction of the S&P 500, you're going to win. You're going to win big. And if you're one of these people who are very aggressively shouting down their keyboard that the market's going to crash, or if you're one of these big news pundits, put your money where your mouth is. Obviously, I think this is a stupid idea. It's a ridiculous amount of risk for a situation that is less and less likely to occur as the days go on. I'm not even particularly a fan of holding back some money just in case it does crash again. Cash is a valid position. I mean, if you're value investing, you can sit there and just wait, if you can afford to. I'm not even a big fan of gold. I think it's a bit of a waste of time, unless you're really, really good at figuring out when your money has to come out and go back into stocks. And it won't surprise you that I'm not smart enough to do that. I simply just have historical evidence that eventually the stock market will recover and continue on to new highs. And really, that's the only proven investment strategy that works. It doesn't really matter whether you're a value investor, whether you're a dividend investor, whether you put stuff into ETFs. The only proven way to continuously make money in the stock market is to cost fucking average. Yeah, I did it. I say it that often. I put it on a T-shirt. What can I say? But in truth, cost averaging is the only way to make money in the market. I personally don't see a reason why I would sell any of my stocks right now, why I would hold back money or buy into gold or even fucking short the market. It's just not within my capability and I'm too lazy for it. It doesn't matter if you're choosing ETFs, it doesn't matter if you're choosing value over innovation, time in the market is always better than timing the market. We could possibly see the markets rock up to record highs and that's the reason for me to stay in. We could see a long drawn out recession, a long slow recovery. I don't see any reason to sell there right now either. And in the worst case, if the market crashes and we see a depression that lasts absolutely decades, I won't really care too much about my money at that point. I'll be trying to figure out if my COVID mask doubles up as a tear gas protector. So I'm not going to be holding any money back. I'm not going to be selling. I'm certainly not going to be shorting, but I'm going to be cost fucking averaging. Just keeping on going, keeping my emergency fund up, 
making sure that I don't spend any money that I definitely won't need for the next 10 years, and simply hoping that society doesn't collapse around us. I think I do need to go a bit more into why cost averaging works. I don't have the endurance for that right now because this feels like a really long video again. So over the next week, I'll be putting a big video together on why I think cost averaging works. Feel free to leave me a comment below letting me know your opinion. I'm always open to what other people think. You're also welcome to discuss this at length in the Discord group. I'm in there quite a lot and there's about a thousand other people in there discussing stocks and also discussing the benefits of buying gold or saving some money back for the second crash. So you can get involved and find out what other people think. Casper, who basically runs the entire Discord group and has built it up from scratch, he's put a donation link up on there. I'm pretty much just a passenger in there at the moment. I think it's great that it's becoming a community and now it's so much more than just a Discord group that was related to my channel. It's pretty much a massive UK investment chat room now. It's really cool. But Casper would like to make some improvements and he's set up a donation link in the Discord group. He's looking for like a quid off everyone. And if he can do that, he can make it into a premium account and apparently make it so much better than it already is. And that's about as much knowledge as I have on the situation in there right now. Thank you very much for watching everyone. The app I use is Trading212. If you're looking at starting investing, Trading212 is a pretty good app for it. If you click that link and sign up, you get a free share and one of my subscribers gets a free share as well. And if you enjoyed me rambling on today, then please give this a like and subscribe if you wish. And until next week, just cost fucking average.